Hi everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anne. Uh, I am from EDP New, and I'm here today with a lot of people, including Ines. Ines, you want to say hi? Hi everyone. Good afternoon. We are very happy to have you here today. This is the 24th R&D session by EDP New. Uh, for those who don't know, EDP New is the center for R&D of EDP. Uh, we do research and development projects on the energy sector at an European level. Since 2020, we've been organizing these webinars on a monthly basis, and we call them the R&D sessions. And this is basically where we get together experts to discuss topics regarding the future of the energy sector, the challenges of our sector, and also the basically the solutions that we are already putting into place at EDP. So this is our fourth webinar this year, and for today's session, we have prepared a session dedicated to the topic of the ocean, as you can see, uh, in which we will introduce you some of the R&D solutions that are being developed uh, with the aim uh, of making the oceans a promoter of clean energy uh, or worldwide and as a key driver for decarbonization. So let us just remind you that the recording of each webinar is available on our website. So if you did not have the chance to watch the previous webinars uh, live, you can go now to our website and by reading these QR codes in the slide and you can, you can watch them offline where you will find uh, different topics on R&D projects. Um, regarding today's webinar, at the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A time. So we also want to encourage you to ask questions uh, in the Q&A chat uh, because we have here today with us uh, experts to, to answer your doubts. With no further delays, we welcome you all to this event and wish you all a great session. And now, Tiago, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Inês. Um, so first of all, uh, um, my name is Tiago and I work at EP New as project manager in, on offshore renewables and I'll be co-hosting uh, today's session. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all uh, for, for joining us today and also, I mean, uh, uh, thank word to our distinguished guests. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, I will start with a bit of introduction on the topic related with the ocean. Then we'll have three presentations starting with Benjamin Liner on the new wave of renewables, how marine energy will help building a sustainable future. Then the second presentation on the role of offshore renewables in the decarbonization of the Portuguese economy. And finally, the third presentation on the environmental challenge of offshore renewable. At the end, we'll, be, we'll have these, uh, this uh, Q&A session. So I mean, uh, reinforcing the message of Inish, please feel free to, to pose your questions during the, the presentation. And then we will try to address them all uh, at the end. So jumping into the, the introduction and uh, using the, the opportunity and following last week's uh, UN Ocean Conference, it's clear that we must protect our oceans and they have the potential to be a key driver for the energy transition. Um, according to UN <coughs> Sustainable Development Goals number 14, uh, we must conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. The ocean drives a sustainable system that makes it habitable for the humankind, and so we carefully need to manage this essential resource in order to ensure a sustainable future. As a key message, saving our ocean must remain a priority. Um, regarding the energy transition and the potential uh, of the oceans to do it. Uh, according with the International Energy Agency on its offshore, uh, offshore wind outlook from 2019, uh, offshore wind has the potential to generate more than 420,000 terawatt hour per year worldwide. As we, as we can see, the average capacity factor around the globe is significant, uh, showing that the wind can be highly exploited offshore. Also, according to the International Renewable Energy Agency Innovation Outlook in 2020, 2020 related with the ocean energy technologies, uh, the ocean energy has resources that can generate up 130 uh, terawatt hour um, of electricity per year, considering for this 
uh, technologies like uh, ocean uh, thermal energy conversion, uh, wave, tidal, and salinity gradient. Considering an average scenario uh, that you can see here in this in this graph, ocean energy will be able to generate around 80,000 terawatt hour a year uh, with the, the ocean thermal energy conversion and also the wave uh, wave energy contributing to to the most of it. Um, in line with this. Uh, EDP is changing tomorrow now. Uh, reinforcement is its commitment of being 100% green and carbon neutral by 2030, and anticipating anticipating uh, its carbon ne neutral targets by 20 years with uh, an unprecedented investment of 24 billion years for the energy transition until 2025, with around 80% of this amount uh, for for renewables. Also, EDP has the goal of having no coal uh, on the company's business until 2025. Uh, on the, in the last week, EDP assumed the commitment of including uh, ocean sustainability in its agenda and strategy, assuming the key role of these precious resources and their important role on the company's green goals. Also, EDP announced that it intends to invest around 1.5 uh, billion euros in offshore renewable projects until 2025 proving that the oceans can provide a useful help in the energy transition at the same time that offshore renewables and ocean energy projects must be sustainable, respecting and protecting the ocean environment. Also in line with this, and related with the, the R&D projects here that we have at New, we are still we are also pursuing this ocean potential uh, throughout several uh, several projects from competitive funds. Starting with the use scores that will be later uh, detailed, presented by, by Benjamin. Uh, this project intends to demonstrate uh, the potential of the multi source offshore renewable energy parks with two demos, one in Belgium and another one in Portugal. In Belgium, combined, combining fixed wind with floating PV, and in Portugal, combining floating wind with wave. Then we have also Atlantis with the establishment of a pioneer infrastructure to demonstrate robotic technologies for inspection and maintenance of offshore wind farms. And also area two for resource assessment um, throughout the advanced meteorological and earth observation data to support wind farm developments or developers on the decision making process. Then uh, also Another pro, uh, another bunch of projects related with the with the the offshore. Um, this first one not directly related since it's a, it's a project that was um, that was deployed in a dam, but with the potential to be exploited offshore. We have Fresher, where in Alcave we demonstrate and provided innovative mooring solution for floating PV arrays. Then two projects, uh, Sea Titan and the Ocean Plus, related with the the ocean energy field. C-Titan, a project already concluded where we designed, built and validated an innovative power takeoff solution that can be applied to several uh, wave energy converters. And it's Ocean Plus that intends to develop and demonstrate a suite of second generation of software tools to support the selection, development and deployment of ocean energy solution. And to conclude, our portfolio of ocean related projects, we have uh, Pivot Boy. Uh, this project intends to demonstrate in a relevant environment an innovative floating offshore wind concept uh, with the aim of reducing the LCOE uh, of the technology up to 50%. This uh, solution here combines the capabilities of the tension light platforms with single point mirroring systems. Uh, enabling an easy installation in deep waters and also a small footprint on its anchoring system. In this project, we are developing a part scale prototype, one to three, with a 225 kilowatt turbine in a downwind configuration that is at this stage, as you can see here in this photo, completely assembled and at key side. This down configuration means that the wind came from behind the structure, uh, reducing the mending moments that this structure is, uh, is facing when in operation. Um, this project will be deployed in the Canary Islands and will be directly connected to black, uh, block and test uh, platform. We are now in, a, in, the, in the installation stage uh, where we have already our export cable laid 
and the mirroring and anchoring solution installed. And we are just waiting for a suitable weather window to the platform for permission. So with this said, we can now jump into the, the first presentation of the day about the new wave of renewables, how marine energy will help building a sustainable future. With us today, we have Benjamin Liner. Benjamin is the CTO of DMEC, an international and active accelerator for marine energy based in Den Haag. Benjamin is responsible for the alignment between DMEC's several European and international projects focused on the technology development, market uptake, and political support. Furthermore, he is coordinating EU scores project, which is de-risking the installation of floating solar and wave energy inside offshore wind parks. Before joining DMEC, Benjamin founded a startup on delocalized carbon capture and storage. He holds a PhD from Delft University of Technology in collaboration with NASA and a master's from the Paris London University of Salzburg. Benjamin, when you want, the screen is yours. Thanks a lot, Tiago, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Very happy to be here with you today. Let me get this up. So uh, as Tiago already said, uh, we'll talk a bit about how marine energy will help building a sustainable future and how we do that also together with EDP in the EU SCORES project. And um, But I want to start a bit earlier. I want to start, first of all, what, what is DMEC? So the Dutch Marine Energy Center is an accelerator for marine energy. We are working on four particular fields, which is uh, and accompany companies um, to develop and to, to achieve commercialization. In these four fields, we're working on innovation, so advanced technologies, advance their products. We're working on capital, so how to mobilize investments. So far, we have um, raised 128 million of private and public funding. Uh, use courses in there, of course, a, a huge bunch uh, to develop these technologies further. Especially in the Netherlands, we are shaping policy, so we're really trying to figure out and discussing with the government how the policies need to be aligned to make this new renewables, this new wave of renewables uh, possible. And we also explore different markets around the world and uh, doing that with a lot of international partners, uh, 80, more than 85 by now and uh, with more than 125 technology companies in the marine energy field. Um, marine energy can be very, very different things. I mean, Diago already mentioned that uh, we are talking about tidal energy, we're talking about wave energy, salinity gradient, old tech, to a certain degree also floating solar. and. It can also be installed in very different ways. So what you can see here is um, the integration of marine energy within our infrastructure. In the left picture, you have the Tocado turbines. Uh, Tocado is a tidal energy developer, which is from the Netherlands and has installed these turbines in one of our flood protection areas uh, towards the North Sea. And this is a great combination of two Business case. On the one side, you need the flood protection. It's a it's a necessary infrastructure. On the other side, you can also produce electricity there inside this flood protection. And of course, there are bikes because in the Netherlands, people love bikes more than everything else. Um, then we have the the second picture here is Ecowave Power, a Swedish Israeli company, which also actually has plans in Portugal to install, and they have this uh, converter which can be installed in wave breakers and so on. So it's um, it's a wave device which is kind of installed on shore and can help uh, support or defense infrastructure and produce electricity right there. But it can not just be installed in infrastructure, it can also be installed in large utility scale uh, marine energy areas on the left side. Here you see the orbital uh, turbine. So Orbital Marine is a is a Scottish um, endeavor of uh, large scale tidal energy, floating tidal energy produ uh, production. And on the right, you see a picture, a, a visualization of a future core power offshore wave farm could look like. Um, in Orbital, they're actually installing a second one of these devices currently with another Horizon project, Forward 2030 which is, of course, uh, a great endeavor to make tidal energy more commercial. Tidal energy itself, uh, for example, achieved a 40% LCOE reduction in the last four years, uh, found by the GRC of the European Commission. So we can see also here the cost reduction of these technologies. We can see we are slowly moving towards large-scale farms. I'll talk a bit more about core power in a second, but they're also achieving great new milestones and uh, achieving their way towards commercial, uh, commercial farms. 
Then marine energy can also be used to power remote communities and islands. I have here a few um, examples in the in the top left. You see the rift gen turbine from ORPC. It's a, a nice title turbine for rivers. And um, this one is actually powering a community in Alaska. And it's actually their main source of power since I think two or three years now. So this is a great achievement for the sector as as uh, as a whole. Um, and they're also looking into tidal projects offshore. Then we have Minesto. Many of you might know Minesto. It's like a, a tidal kite, uh, like on the top right and also on the, top, uh, the bottom right, there's sea current, another tidal kite. Uh, Minesto currently has great plans to, to power the Faroe Islands and sea current is powering one of the Dutch islands in Ameland. Um, and then on the bottom left, there is another wave developer, um, Slow Mill, which is a Dutch wave developer who just installed the device two or three weeks ago and will be powering another Dutch island in Tesla. So you see a lot of developments also in that sense of it's a specific market, it's the islands and remote communities where marine energy can play a critical role. Or it can be combined with offshore wind. And that's actually the main topic of my of my short presentation here today, because uh, this is a, a project we lifted off or we started basically in, in terms of uh, procurement and, and um, design of the project two years ago. And uh, a year ago, we really lifted it off, kicked it off then. And it's about, the as, as Tiago already mentioned before shortly, it's about the installation of wave energy devices together with floating wind and, um, floating solar together with bottom fixed wind and i want to i'm happy to take questions on the other technologies and everything but i want to focus a bit on this nice collaborations because we do a lot of things in portugal there and it's a it's a great pleasure to be involved in this project and coordinate this project so eus course is the name it's uh european scalable offshore renewable energy sources but we never used the full name because it's just too long. Um, the EU liked it, they gave us the funding. And it is about enabling the large scale rollout of offshore solar PV and wave energy converters. So we have a quite big consortium out of 12 European countries with 17 partners and seven associated partners and eight, I think by now it's nine scale up advisors. So the Partners include uh, large scale utility companies like EDP, but also RWE or ENL, uh, Simply Blue, um, and I'm forgetting one. But uh, yeah, so with the utility companies together, we're trying to get the commercial part ready, so to really be ready for the for the liftoff. Then we have the two technology developers, which is Oceans of Energy, a Dutch floating solar developer, and Core Power Ocean, which is a Swedish, uh, Swedish Portuguese, we have to say, uh, wave energy developer, and those deliver this technology, and everybody else is supporting them in various ways of achieving this first large scale areas. The reasoning why why are we actually doing this? So why are we going for this multi use approach? And there are two big themes in there. One is the source diversification. By diversifying your source, by having uh, to use wave energy together with wind, together with solar, you get a much more reliable and low cost energy system. You reduce the amount of storage mediums you need and uh, can just balance the grid better. The graphic you can see here is um, uh, from the from the west coast of California. It was a study Core Power did together with some partners in the US. And you can see the real production of solar energy and wind energy in California. And then based on the buoys which were installed there, the production potential production of wave energy here. And as you can see, we, uh, wind and solar quite complementary, which is good for using your cables, using your infrastructure, and wave energy also quite stable, especially in the Atlantic Ocean, which has a very long wave swell. So waves come from uh, produced very far away. So that together gives a very balanced grid, and it can increase the revenues of a wind farm developer and offshore park developer, because at the same time, you're uh, compared to your competition, you're not just selling electricity when the wind is blowing, but you're also selling electricity when it's sunny and, for example, the wind is not blowing or when it's just wavy. And Benjamin, have, Benjamin yes? sorry to interrupt you just very quickly. Uh, you have no here problem. that, yeah, 
exactly the the teams which is i mean it's covering your your slide sorry sorry to I, will, to I will hide you i will hide you <laughs> okay perfect thank you very perfect. much Th thanks for for pointing it out um and then uh, of course tiago pointed out because offshore hydrogen or hydrogen production general is a really important topic also for edp so we want to see all of that so uh for the hydrogen production part it's also good to have a more consistent electricity supply and we did actually a study in the netherlands for the tenor for the Watten Islanden. it's a wind park a planned wind park in the north of the Watten islands and uh, in this wind park, we saw we could increase the capacity factor of the wind park by up to 20% with adding wind, uh, sorry, adding solar and wave in there, which utilizes your electrolyzer under much, uh, much longer time and therefore improves the business case for hydrogen. But we are investigating that further uh, throughout the project. The second reasoning is the source co-location. Um, we're having already a very, I mean, from our perspective, we have a very busy North Sea, but we have just in general very busy seas and coastal areas in the in Europe. So there are many stakeholders which need to be arranged, uh, fishery, transportation vessels, uh, military, and of course also energy production. By co-locating the sources, you can reduce the space massively, which also leaves more space for these other stakeholders and just nature in general. And some of the parts can just be co-used. So for example, you can co-use your cables, you can co-use your substations, which leads to a, a cost reduction. Also the operational costs we, we are looking in, into because maybe they can be reduced as well when you can co-use vessels, et cetera, for the, for, the, um, for the two different or three different sources. So that's a bit the reasoning where we are coming from and why we are investigating this in this EU's course project. But we have to do a lot of de-risking and we have to see what are the challenges and how can we avoid and mitigate these challenges. First of all, technical challenges. These systems though, have not been installed for 20 years or 30 years like offshore wind. So we have still a lot of things to learn about the installation, about the maintenance, about the operations. So in offshore solar PV, for example, the system, which is displayed here from Ocean of Energy, that was just a 50 kilowatt system that was installed for two years now offshore of The Hague, uh, I think 13 kilometers offshore, but only two years and not grid connected. So the next step and also a smaller size. So the next step is now making it grid connected, improving or increasing the size and installing it for at least another two years or even longer if possible. The same is true for Wave Energy Corpo has had very successful tests of their scale device, now bringing out their full scale device and uh, with uh, use course them really an array of multiple devices interconnected and also interconnected with uh, uh, offshore substation. And last but not least, also in technical de-risking, we have to understand how all these different technologies fit together and come together in a large scale park design. So. Here are, is an example from Innistech, uh, one of the partners who works on um, robotics and how we can use autonomous robotics for getting the most out of the shared maintenance and shared inspection. But it's also the grid connection. It's also the operation maintenance schedule, how this, the, the anchoring and mooring, how all of that comes together in the large scale park design of this multi-use park. So that's on the technical de-risking side to really say to really get more trust into the technology and this combination of technology and therefore also de-risk it for potential investors and uh, initiate the financial de-risking. So the financial de-risking has, of course, a lot to do with the business cases for specific regions in the EU. So here we are really looking into what is achievable in terms of business case for electricity production, but also for molecule production. So, for example, green hydrogen. And we are looking into, OK, what are the learning rates and cost reductions? What, what, what is making sense based on, on the lessons learned? And what can we forecast based on the offshore wind sector in terms of where these technologies are moving to? So that's, of course, an important factor because only with scale of these technologies, we will achieve cost reduction, which is um, suitable to have a profitable business case because just from demonstration projects, they are rather expensive. But if you go in a large scale area, same as with offshore wind back then, if you go in large scale installations, you will reduce the cost and will become a beneficial, uh, generate a beneficial business case. 
And last but not least, the regulatory de-risking. Of course, there are many stakeholders um, to be engaged and to be discuss discussing this with from the offshore industry, from the coastal communities, from nature groups and non-for-profit organizations. And we have to have good answers to their questions, environmental impact. We have to good answer on terms of does it take away space from them, like fisheries, uh, and discuss with them together to have a common front and uh, a common a common goal there. Then, of course, towards the government, we are looking into resource and energy system modeling. So that really shows them what is the potential in their country and why should they support it, especially in the beginning, it needs subsidies. Um, the, the novel technologies always need subsidies in the energy sector in the beginning. So why should they do it? And we really want to quantify for them the, the benefit based on hard data. And last but not least, also then, not just why should they do it and what should they do. So what are the most beneficial, most helpful uh, policies and regulations coming from the sector? So what would we say is needed to achieve this? And we, here we focus really on the Netherlands or the, uh, the Benelux area on Iberia, so Spanish, uh, Portuguese area and Ireland um, as the main, the main focus points. The ambition is, of course, a rapid scale up. So we are now starting with EU scores with a three megawatt floating solar um, installation close to a 170 megawatt wind park and a 1.2 megawatt uh, wave installation not too far away from wind flow Atlantic. So 25 megawatt installation. But based on that, we want to de risk and then step by step upscale it to actually parks with hundreds of megawatts of size in floating solar and wave energy um, together with the winds. So that's the ambition of this project to lay the foundation, the cornerstone for this subsequent upscaling all over Europe and also outside of Europe. And we as DMEC are, of course, open for collaboration to explore marine energy solutions around the world. Uh, discussing with policymakers the necessary frameworks for lifting off marine energy in your region and also for project developers, utility companies, assisting them in choosing the right technologies for your use case. And feel free to reach out to me. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I hope I'm in time. And uh, thanks again for your attention and listening in. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Uh, we'll be now jumping into our second presentation of the day. Um, this second presentation will be about the role of offshore renewables in the decarbonization of the Portuguese economy. And for that, we'll have with us Marco. Marco Alves. Sorry, Marco. Uh, so Marco holds a PhD in mechanical engineering and a master's, in, a master's degree in management and strategy. Is currently the Chief Innovation Officer at Cola Plus Atlantic, having previously held the position of Head of Numerical Modeling at Wayback Offshore Renewables, and having also been visiting researcher at Imperial College <laughs> in London. He holds key expertise on several scientific fields, including engineering control systems, linear and nonlinear numerical simulations, fluid dynamics, coastal engineering, and dynamics of floating bodies. His track record has been mostly focused on marine renewables, a field in which he has wide experience in providing technical and strategic support to technology developers. Marco, please, when you want, feel free. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tiago. Um, before start, I would like to, to thank EDP New for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to participate in this, in this event. So I will briefly talking about the rule of offshore or the potential rule of offshore renewables in the decarbonization of Portuguese economy. And um, I will split the presentation in three main parts. The first one, I will just briefly uh, create the framework of the present day context. Um, then I will talk about the prospects of uh, the, the current prospects uh, in Portugal. Not exactly on offshore renewables, because I will specify the case of uh, offshore wind, just because it's one of the, the, the sources, offshore sources, renewable sources that is a bit more advanced. I hope in a few years we can say exactly the same about wave energy and other sources. And then I will share with you some recommendations to achieve the, the, these goals. 
Uh, these recommendations are not my recommendations. It's basically the the outcome of the work that we have been uh, doing with uh, with uh, with BBVA, a global finance uh, uh, group. Um, is a document that gathers uh, recommendations to promote the growth of the blue economy, and basically um, it was the result of uh, of many. Uh, events of, of engagement of stakeholders engagement focus on these topics in order to to promote these 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 blue economy growth in portugal uh, the document is 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 in still in uh, ongoing process will be released will be released very soon soon means one two weeks no more than that um, and then we can we you can go through it. it. Will be freely available. We can go through it and see much more details than those that I will share with you here uh, today. So the 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 present day context is very easy to to um, uh, define to some extent. We have an economy an economy based on fossil fuels, completely based on fossil fuels. Uh, just uh, uh, as an example. 72% of the primary energy consumption Euro in uh, Europe is based on fossil fuels. So we know the effects. The effects are basically the greenhouse uh, produced by the combustion. Of course, this uh, we can skip the details about climate change. Uh, we are more than than familiarized with 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 these consequences. So we need to decarbonize, decarbonize the economies is, is a very critical aspect that we are facing, a huge issue that, we, that uh, you are facing. But at the same time, it also represents a unique opportunity for a healthy and greener world. Completely aligned and in the, in, the, in the wake of the conference last week, the Ocean Conference from the United Nations here in Lisbon, completely aligned with, uh, with the, the, the promoted uh, ODS. So the solution, not exactly the solution, but at least part of the solution is basically to replace fossil fuels by uh, renewable sources. So we believe that this is part of the solution. And just to give you uh, uh, um, um, the, the dimension of the, the, this, this, this possibility, uh, basically there's a lot of estimates that um, uh, say that we can reach only with the offshore wind uh, 450 gigawatts of installed capacity in 2050, which, mean, which means about 25% uh, of the uh, Europe uh, electricity demand. So we are talking about a, a huge part of the of the, the electricity demand that we can we can solve with uh, with offshore wind, and of course we can we can think. Uh, uh, to some extent that if we add um, wave energy, if we add tidal, if we add floating solar, probably these numbers will be much higher. But anyway, I think is 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 a, a, num a, a number big enough to to show a bit or to to display the magnitude of the solution. So Portugal um has some ambition on float uh, on floating uh, on floating wind and uh, on renewable in a, in a more uh, wide uh, wider aspect uh and this this ambition is stated by this sentence and basically portugal plans to hold the first auction in 2023 for awarding between 6 and 8 uh, gigawatts of floating wind, uh, and this is this is basically uh, the state's the ambition of Portugal. But we need to go to to go a bit further on this on this sentence and understand the consequences of this standard or the benefits of this standard, this this uh, statement. And we will we can make some kind of uh, easy calculations based on many many estimates, and this implies. Uh, an, uh, an annual direct CO2 uh, emissions avoided between 20 and 25 million tons. This is between 6 and 8 gigawatts of capacity. It, the, the equivalent is between 20 and 25 million tons of uh, CO2 emissions avoided. Of course, there is also some 
uh, consequences from the, the, the some kind of social uh, socio socioeconomic impact. And here we will be talking about employment employment generation between 100,000 and 130,000 jobs will be created. 60% of those jobs will be direct. Uh, workers on this on this field, 40% indirect jobs. But anyway, uh, in direct or indirect, we are talking about a huge percentage of high uh, qualified jobs. And high qualified jobs means much higher value added to the, the economy. And uh, on the business side, we are talking about a turnover between 10,000 and 13,000 million euros. Okay. So this is basically the, frame, the framework of the Portuguese ambition on, on uh, offshore wind. So to reach this, this, this level of development to some extent, this, this work that I mentioned before that we had been uh, developing with the BBVA um, is, is gathering some recommendations and these recommendations are basically uh, or uh, they have the ambition to prepare the country for the opportunities that are, arise from this expected rapid growth of offshore wind. So the idea is to prepare the the country for the incoming uh, the, the incoming uh, years. So I will share with you ten of the the that there the, there are much more than ten recommendations. It's a huge list of recommendations. I will select ten that I will share with you, but of course, then you can go uh, in the document, go deep on it and understand a bit more with more details. So the first the first recommendation is focused on the, 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 the implementation of testing areas to to demonstrate ocean technologies. Uh, Portugal is already and the Portugal government is already giving the right steps in this direction with the creation of uh, technological free zones. But of course, we need to accelerate accelerate this, 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 this process to, and is basically the, the, second, the second recommendation, to attract developers to demonstrate ocean technologies here in Portugal. What is the main uh, interest of attracting developers is not exactly the technology, of course it is also the technology, but not, not only the technology, the intention is to bring additional or to increase the maturity of the national supply chain in a, uh, in a in, of an ecosystem around this technology, uh, this demonstration ocean technology areas. Okay, and and this this increase of maturity will prepare the national supply chain for the scale the the, the scaling up um, uh, of 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 the sector in a, in a, in a few in a few years. So preparing uh, um, as, as overall the objective is prepare the scale up of offshore uh, offshore wind. Then the third recommendation is a bit also focused on uh, with eyes fixed on scaling up and large scale implementation of offshore wind is basically mapping, monitor and characterize potential locations to exploit offshore renewables. Here we will need to to collect data and to, to conduct surveys, to collect data on the, on depths, the symmetry, soil type, uh, water column, temperature, salinity, turbidity, water quality. And the idea is to mitigate the risk of offshore renewable projects. So when people come to install, to develop projects, they know exactly what, what is in the sea, what they need to do, what they have all the knowledge they need to develop the projects. This is also a very critical aspect pointed out by many, many stakeholders. Then we have the, the another from a different uh, standpoint, we need to promote innovation in the blue economy. This, this innovation here is a bit in a, in a, in a wider perspective. We are not focused on, on just around the, the, the pilot zone and the, the needs of developers to develop the, the technology. We are a bit more, as I said, in a wide perspective because it, there is a need in Portugal. I believe that uh, in many countries around the world and, in, and, and uh, they, they, they are facing the, the same difficulties to, to reinforce this bidirectional relationship between companies and universities or R&D centers. Okay. So we need to involve 
the, the universities in innovative process with, uh, with academia in order to avoid, in order to promote and, and facilitate the entry of the, in the market of new products and, and, and new services, at least to accelerate this process. Um, then we will need in the same line to incentive the production of uh, the, the production and the transfer of knowledge. And this is basically not only the, the, the production of scientific and technological uh, uh, knowledge, where the, the R&D centers, where the universities are, are, are basically the, the drivers of this process, but we will need to look around and to understand how uh, we can foster cross-fertilization. This means like bring knowledge from other sectors and other sectors and uh, 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 other sec uh, sectors may be um, uh, the shipping industry, the oil and gas industry, and other industries, adjacent industries, bring the knowledge to, to promote the, 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 the offshore renewables. And also, and this, is, this, this was a very nice discussion, I cannot share with you uh, because we don't have time, but uh, uh, one of the things that will be really stressed by Core Power and, and Benjamin talked about uh, the company, so they, it's basically a wave energy converter developer, was basically the, the, the valuing tacit knowledge. And this is very, is very important. And the tacit knowledge is, is knowledge very difficult to codify and it's very difficult to to put it in a paper and explain and 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 and, and, and define what this type of knowledge is, because it's very important, and is and exists in in industries like metal construction and so on. So these these techniques that people knows because I mean is is basically empirical knowledge, experiment uh, experimental knowledge uh, based on 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 the on the on the, the experience and the, the expertise of the people and this is very important to 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 be applied in these new sectors and to to, to speed up the development in the, and the implementation then we will have the articulation of offshore renewables with other sectors and benjamin also stressed already this this aspect on the us course project is very critical it's very critical because uh, we can, uh, and when we uh, we talk about other sectors of the blue economy, we can think on on uh, algae production. We can think on aquaculture and so on, and many many different act activities. The idea here is um, is basically to reduce to reduce um, capex and opex. So there is a. a, a an advantage from the, the, the let's say the techno-economic side, but at the same time uh, we can uh, maximize environmental benefits. So we can use algae production to let's say a, a, as an example to absorb CO2, and this absorbed CO2 um, plus the CO2 that is that is avoided with a, with a floating farm. Uh, increases a bit the, the the environmental benefit. Okay, this is basically the 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 idea of articulating different uh, different uh, different uh, sectors of the blue economy. Then we will need to um, streamline a bit licensing mechanisms, and licensing mechanism um, must be uh, um, created or to some extent developed in a very stable and transparent regulatory environment. And this transparent regulatory environment is, is, is very critical, as well as the approval criteria. So the approval criteria must, must be based not only or not at all in the, in the, in the policy of uh, first come, first serve, but basically on, on, on the estimate of the potential socioeconomic benefits. When we are talking about licensing mechanisms, we are, we are talking about authorizations to develop the, uh, the, uh, a project in the sea. So we will need to add a lot of uh, additional information to those projects to understand those that are more convenient for the, the, for the, 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 from a socioeconomic perspective. Uh, another another recommendation is is in the um, in the uh, maritime special planning 
and the maritime social uh, special planning instrument. So the idea here is to include in this MSP the the um, these new sectors of the blue economy. So integrate in the in the maritime special planning uh, offshore wind, integrate in maritime so uh, special planning. Uh, wave energy, algae, uh, algae production, combining uh, the, the, these multi-objective uh, platforms, combining all these these, these activities. Uh, this is critical and was one of the most uh, voted, let's say, recommendations. Then we have extra two recommendations, uh, a bit more on the investment side, because of course investment is critical to develop this sector. Uh, this and, and the other sectors is basically the same. So the, the one of the, the, the key aspects was basically the, the accelerate the, the mechanisms uh, and accelerate the issuance of uh, blue bonds in Portugal. The blue bonds is a mechanism not, well, not very well defined yet, but of course we need to speed up this process. These blue bonds or, or debt in, uh, instruments are critical to support investments in the blue economy. So we need to do it with a with a, with, a, with a policy based on on efficiency on transparency in order to support decision making with with all the available information on uncertainties on risks etc. Um, and finally, to is, is also very, very critical, uh, improving the business environment to attract basically with the same with the same uh, objective that I mentioned at uh, the business environment to attract investment. Why is it so critical? Because, um, of course, if we have an, uh, uh, if we have some kind of lack efficiency on the administrative processes in the regulatory framework and so on, so investors will look at us with a, with a very uh, in a suspicious way. Okay. So the idea is to increase this the the, the, the stability, long term stability, uh, that brings confidence to the investors. With a, uh, at the end of the day, will be uh, reflected in the in the cost of capital, in the reduction of the cost of capital, and reducing the cost of capital has a huge impact on the LCOE. And of course, the reducing gas LCOE make the, the make the sector more competitive. So these ten ten um, recommendations, as I said at the beginning of the my, of my presentation, was well collected with in, in in involving a lot of stakeholders. The report uh, on it will be released very soon, and so we can see a lot of details that uh, we cannot explore here for for, for time constraints. A lot of details on this with some numbers, with some additional justifications. Uh, but I think is basically, and I would like to finish with this, um, is basically so, uh, there are recommendations designed to some extent for the Portuguese reality. No, no, no doubt about it. This was basically the objective. But these are recommendations, at least many of, the, uh, of these recommendations can be mimicked in other countries, in other parts of the of the of the world, because at the end of the day, the need to develop and the need to to implement these sectors is not is not a national need only. is 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 of course there's a, the, the, there's a lot of uh, of uh, of countries with uh, with the same uh, with the same strategy and the strategy that uh, that uh, relies on the development of these sectors. So probably for those countries. For, for those regions, these type of recommendations will, will be also uh, very uh, interesting. Okay, so this is basically, I think I managed to do it on time. Almost. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, without any further delays, we'll be jumping for the third presentation of the day. Uh, related with the environmental challenge of offshore renewables. And uh, today with us for, for this presentation, we have Inês Machog. Uh, Inês holds a, a master's degree in marine science from the University of Porto and the PhD in marine sciences from the Faculty of Sciences, University of Lisbon. Inês research started in the Department of Oceanography and Fisheries in the Portuguese Institute for Sea and Atmosphere 
focusing on the detection of impacts of human activities in the sea, such as artisanal and industrial fisheries. She integrated WaveVec into, in 2012 as a researcher and project manager and has been involved in several R&D project, projects on EIA marine renewable energy projects. She is a researcher on the environmental impacts of offshore renew, of offshore biofueling growth and impacts on marine mammals caused by marine renewables and offshore wind devices. She is a lecturer in the European Masters in Renewable Energy at IST of University of Lisbon on environmental aspects of offshore technology, marine spatial planning, and GIS tools to support the renewable energy site selection. Inej, please feel free. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Tiago, for this nice presentation, and thank you, Edip, and you for um, inviting me here for this um, for this event. It is a pleasure uh, to be here today. So my presentation will be based on the subject of the environmental challenges uh, that offshore renewables face, uh, mostly focused in the scenery here of uh, the Portuguese economy. Um, in, in terms of um, of advancing uh, projects in offshore renewable energy, there are several environmental risks that uh, are recognized and already been identified here by my colleagues, but I would like to mention them all and to give them a framework in terms of their environmental perspectives. So there is a widespread and general lack of data regarding the ocean. Um, so this is not contributing to the to the correct development of the sector. Data such as understanding the wind resources or wave resource in areas further offshore, seabed geology uh, are still rather unknown. Uh, there is also uh, this is also due to the difficulties of sur survey and associated costs to to performance of these surveys. So there is. Um, uh, a deficient collection of data further offshore. This also brings us to unknown environmental impacts, because if we don't know the, the existing environment, how can we address the impacts that can be can occur? Uh, and also lack of uh, um, knowledge regarding the effects of scaling up projects from um, uh, uh, only uh, prototypes to commercial projects. All of these aspects lead to uncertainties during the licensing process, and like Marco was saying, that needs to be uh, um, streamlined. But these uncertainties lead to longer processes and lack of confidence of regulatory authorities to license these projects in the marine environment. Another important aspect is the harmonization with other maritime special, special users, um, such as, for instance, fishermen, which are a well-known uh, direct conflict with, uh, with offshore renewables. Uh, also important is to highlight that there, is, there are a large number of involved players in these um, environmental aspects, uh, initiating with marine special users such as um, commercial fisheries, artisanal fisheries, uh, and uh, uh, recreational ones. Also, a large number of regulatory authorities are involved in the process with, together with consultancy companies, R&D institutions, and also the population in general, like Benjamin was saying, that needs to be properly heard and involved. Of course, as all of you are aware, there is a great variety of number of technologies and structures placed at sea with differ on their methods of capturing energy and on the, um, let me remove this, and on their location. So these differences will reflect on, on different potential environmental impacts and their magnitude in the marine environment, which also makes it more difficult to address uh, the, the impacts associated. Many of the potential impacts are related to offshore activities during the pre-construction and construction stage, and these are the most relevant ones that can consist in mining or piling or dredging, uh, while other impacts come from the presence and the operation of the equipment. These effects may translate in changes in the hydrodynamics and physical configuration of the seabed and the project area, and consequently promote changes in the habitats and communities there. Other effects are related with the development of artificial reefs, which may promote beneficial local biodiversity and create habitats for protected or commercial species of interest, but it will also promote the propagation of um, non-native species across regions. 
other potential negative impacts come from underwater noise and electromagnetic fields that have similar impacts in disturbing the local biodiversity at different levels. Uh, again, also the water pollution, such as chemical pollution or marine litter, uh, can lead to changes in water characteristics, such as nutrients, temperature, and general water contamination. Positive impacts need to be also highlighted and include socioeconomic effects, such as local development with the creation of new opportunities for companies and jobs enhancement. In general, when comparing the existing uh, offshore uh, industry or with the, or at least the fixed flow, uh, uh, offshore wind devices with floating offshore wind devices. Studies suggest that floating offshore wind will have relatively minor effects during the operational stages of its life, life cycle. Um, since uh, deep water floating offshore wind lacks fixed foundations, they do not require pile driving, which is amongst the most um, environmental impact uh, impactful practice associated with construction of fixed uh, offshore uh, renewable devices. So um, this is uh, specifically associated with the relatively high noise levels that can cause displacement and injury of marine mammals and changes in fish behavior. Also, Floating offshore wind uh, devices can be constructed onshore prior to transportation and, and um, further offshore uh, and transportation to the offshore site, which can also reduce both the amount of noise uh, emissions uh, from vessels and also uh, the construction in, at site uh, and uh, related impacts in the marine environment. Also, another beneficial aspect is the fact that due to the higher distance to shore, um, floating uh, offshore wind energy will have lower visual impacts. And also, in another perspective, more economic, it has access to more consistent winds offshore that can increase in energy revenues. As a um, the only major environmental disadvantage uh, is uh, the increase of electromagnetic fields that can occur due to inter array of cables in the water column due to its uh, floating uh, characters. In terms of environmental issues that can be perceived uh, from these sectors, uh, they're mostly affecting environmental receptors, the physical environmental receptors, such as hydrodynamics, water column, the seabed and shoreline, and biological uh, receptors that include benthic communities, fish and turtles, marine mammals, and birds. These um, the, the, the perceived impacts regarding each of these environmental receptors are relatively well studied and identified. In terms of environmental monitoring, each of these uh, environmental receptors uh, ha have been already established uh, monitoring parameters and corresponding monitoring techniques. Of course, these uh, techniques are also always developing, and this is one of the issues that I'm going to address here. In general, as examples, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of acoustic techniques that can be used to monitor the marine environment, such as sea pods and hydrophones. They are commonly uh, been implemented in monitoring programs. Sea uh, pods um, are usually used to assess the impact of devices on cetacean species due to um, the obstacles that they uh, they they constitute in the environment and due to the underwater noise that uh, is incremented. When uh, these uh, sensors that detect the sounds or the clicks of dolphins, uh, so they detect their occurrence, their time of occurrence, and the characteristics of the signal. It, these are perfect sensors to do fine scale studies in terms of spatial distribution if we want to target the detection of dolphins. On the other hand, uh, you can also use hydrophones that can be used with two purposes, both the detection of animals or to characterize and monitor the ambient noise or, uh, and the noise radiated by the devices. So we can perform analysis that we want in terms of uh, a human or ambient noise or uh, um, other biological source uh, from marine animals. The main drawback of hydrophone is, is that depending on the sampling rate, uh, it's not possible to have long-term measurements. As a um, 
relatively quick example. I'm going to show you the left graphic here, which shows the variation of pr sound pressure with time. Um, and then after doing several analysis, is it possible to obtain a spectrogram shown in the right where you can see the intensity of the uh, sound pressure level in decibels. Here you can also see the overlap of uh, hearing range of marine organisms and uh, different uh, sources of underwater noise, such as natural, anthropogenic or biological. Coupling with this underwater noise monitoring, there are also um, visual observations that, that are performed to address cetaceans and uh, birds communities, and these are based on boats. During visual surveys, uh, it's collected a lot of information about the oceanographic and meteorological conditions that is then coupled to the uh, information registered about organisms, uh, identifying the presence of calves or other groups uh, as an example. This uh, data set is then retrieved and introduced in the distance uh, software, which is based on R programming. Uh, in terms of water quality, we also it's also a common procedure in terms of environmental monitoring to detect contaminations or uh, oil spills, for instance, and it's made to obtain um, uh, data also to complementary data for communities, marine communities analysis. Uh, so we can do this by performing seawater uh, sampling through the Niskin bottle, bottle showed here that can be done at different depths and also parameters of uh, measurements such as the this probe here, like a CTD cast or a multi-parameter probe that gives you a lot of information of the parameters that we want to study. This can consist uh, of nutrients, chlorophylla A, pollutants, greases, several several uh, contaminants. In terms of benthic habitats and communities, uh, commonly it's necessary to, um, to do this assessment. It can be done in two perspectives, through only visual observation using video and photographic monitoring, or in situ sampling where we um, done, that can be done both in parallel, but this is uh, done through the using a dredge, and or a quadrat, for instance, where we can collect the different specimens that occur in the area prior to installation and post-installation. Another important factor is biofolding, uh, which has been uh, requested by most um, regulatory authorities in terms of environmental monitoring. It's uh, an issue that has been um, that has been mentioned a lot, that, and re refers to the assemblages of uh, organisms that grow on the artificial structures that are implemented in the area. Uh, so this can be uh, can can constitute microorganisms or macroorganisms, and includes uh, organisms such as bacteria, fungi, microalgae, and uh, and also. A calcareous algae or are hard following organisms such as barnacles or mussels. Here, the methodology to address these aspects is relatively similar uh, to the assessment of marine communities in general. We can do video and photographic monitoring or uh, in situ sampling through test panels or quadrant uh, scraping. Uh, here you can see a lot of test panels that were that we already have deployed. Considering that uh, in WAVEC we have participated in several EU projects or national projects regarding uh, biofouling, we prepared and we have um, an open source uh, available for download database um, in that collected information on the organisms occurrence throughout uh, Europe, including information on coordinates, distance from shore of each project, and key biofouling par parameters to the offshore removal sectors, such as thickness and weight. This tool aims to, to support developers planning their projects in terms of type of coatings to be used and the type of maintenance and operations that should be uh, foreseen. All in all, uh, our expertise regarding all the projects that we have um, have uh, accompanied in Portugal, such as the ones that are exemplified here, we have been identifying a lot of challenges throughout these uh, the implementations of mon environmental monitoring. So. Uh, 
I'm going to mention uh, most of the ones that we have identified and uh, possible solutions to uh, to tackle these these issues. Uh, first of all, it's very wide range of human pressures and impacts that uh, occur in each project, so it's rather hard to tackle them all. Um, we have uh, we have obviously identified the need for more frequent and long term monitoring since there are a lot of variability in the ocean that it's very difficult to account for uh, and due to the large uh, variable components that uh, can comprehend the marine environment and obviously marine communities are highly variable so they can vary a lot between seasons or interannually and this is very difficult to tackle also to distinguish the changes owed to a specific anthropogenic impact the ones that we're searching uh, from the ones that are owed to natural variability that occurs in the marine environment also difficult to overcome is the highly hydrodynamic conditions, obviously part of the, of the work, but we have sometimes very short weather windows that we need to overcome and act very quickly. There is also a lot of differences between legislations among uh, countries. Uh, this occurs even in, at the EU level. So when a developer comes to one, works in one country and has its own expertise, then if he's doing it in another country, he will face a lot of difficulties again because the process procedures are distinct. And this is a thing that we have uh, encountered a lot. It's also very important to um, follow all the met methods and metrics that are already existing guidance and um, it's uh, been a, a struggle a long struggle to try and implement risk-based assessment and adaptive management measures to reduce existing scientific uncertainty this uh, these um, these uh, techniques aim to use existing information from previous projects and adapt it and use it in future projects but there's still no legal framework for these uh, strategies and it's very difficult to implement them. As recommendations, uh, our main goal here is that we would wish to reduce scientific uncertainty as associated with the environmental impacts. So longer time series and wider spatial air areas would be relevant, although we understand that this increases costs and it's not one of the factors that the industry uh, really needs at this moment. So um, it's also important to use adaptive management uh, techniques. Also, new uh, new strategies to combine data uh, with already existing uh, data sets and with new uh, uh, methods such as using satellite data, numerical modeling, using a lot of open source data. There are newly developed platforms everywhere that can bring us a lot of interesting data. Uh, and also uh, using machine learning as new methodologies. As I was saying, the implementation of adaptive monitoring plans could also support the industry in moving forward faster. Uh, it's also important now with uh, use, uh, another uh, or the co-location with other blue economy sectors to understand the cumulative impacts of uh, using of co-locating activities. Lastly, there is also the need to create and improve synergies with other marine uses. So. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of co-location suggestions have been uh, put uh, on the table, and one of them is, is to consider the the offshore uh, renewable energy areas as marine protected areas. This has advantages in terms of um, creating no-take zones that can create spillover effects to adjacent areas, especially if we're looking for commercially important species. However, there should be some caution since there are ecosystems created are not exactly similar to the natural ones, and this can bring the opportunity to invasive species. Also looking into al algae aquaculture and the combination with offshore wind, floating offshore wind more precisely, it provides an alternative food supply and a renewable marine resource. Uh, algae production is also a source of primary product productivity, promoting the observation of absorption of carbon from the water column that is afterwards to supply supply those nutrients to the entire food web. Also, synergies and links exist between the offshore wind and hydrogen sectors. Hydrogen, hydrogen can here fulfill the role of energy storage and even act as an energy carrier. So um, it's a relevant source of um, of uh, synergies that can be uh, looked into and is already being looked into. Uh, and also there are 
really important aspects related with the uh, demands uh, regarding synergies with fisheries, uh, understanding that maybe fisheries benefit from offshore wind, floating offshore wind more precisely, and therefore mitigating the loss of fishing grounds is considered a key aspect for co-location solutions uh, in uh, the marine, maritime space. As, for, as an example, in Germany, studies have shown that um, brown crab fisheries increase increases benefited from the rev rapid expansion of offshore wind farms. This is a rather relevant study that can contribute to um, to advise marine spatial planning processes on how to regulate a sustainable co-location of fisheries and offshore winds. For instance, they gave an example as a, a fixed um, uh, art, which is pot fisheries that are very well suited for co-location uh, with, um, with uh, floating or fixed offshore winds since this uh, type of art spots do not disturb the seabed and therefore pose no risk to damage cables or other off, uh, offshore wind infra infrastructures. Of course, this should be obviously uh, included in a framework of a legal framework and uh, um, security or safety uh, issues. But this is a problem that will uh, for sure uh, arise several times. So I apologize. My apologies. I think I'm a little bit over my time. Uh, a minute. I'm open for questions. Okay, Nish. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now, I mean, since we are uh, a bit delayed, uh, we will be just uh, trying to address I mean, one question for each each one of you. I mean, I kindly ask you to to please uh, reply reply fast, and you know, I mean, to to have the majority of the people still still in line. Just before we jump into the questions for you, we have here a comment from Romana Flavia from Brazil. Uh, I mean, and just to clarify, I mean, uh, she's saying that um, in this meeting, just to understand what EDP is doing around the world for decarbonization. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity and ask if there is a possibility to re replicate these kind of solutions in here. So I guess uh, we were referring to the to the to the projects that we presented at the beginning of the session. So just to clarify, um, these are EU funded projects. So within the the European Community, and the, this is exactly our I mean our goal here at EDP New. So trying to find out uh, new new solutions in this case on on the renewables fields and then to identify strong business cases to to replicate this across the uh, EDP business. Uh, now jumping into the question, so I will start with Benjamin. Uh, we have a question from from Jose. Uh, it's saying hi Benjamin, thank you for your presentation. Uh, which are the most promising technologies for wave energy converters in the medium term? Also considering the technologies that today are still in concept phase. Thanks, Tiago, and uh, thanks, Jose, for this question. I think this is a question I cannot really answer in a short way and also not in a panel like that. Um, there are about 100 wave technology developers we have in our database. Uh, everybody has some advantages, some disadvantages. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are a few like core power or ocean energy or which are going really strong, but really to give a dedicated answer to that uh, would mean uh, an own session by itself. A new webinar, right? Exactly. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, Benjamin. Now for Mark, we have a question from Nunu. Uh, he's saying Portugal has a privileged position in terms of, of the ocean area uh, it has. Do you see this as something uh, something the country can leverage to play an important role in producing energy to Europe? If yes, what are the important steps? Uh, this is, a, this uh, again, uh, very difficult to answer this question in, in, um, in, a short, uh, in a short time. I think Portugal can, in fact, play a very important role in producing ocean energy. Uh, but of course, this rule uh, is is deeply dependent on the evolution of an, of other sectors like wave energy. So let's assume that we succeed with the, with the projects like the, the the core power demonstration project here in Portugal, uh, with the supply chain matured based on the experience gained in these projects. I think, uh, of course, the 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 
a bright future is open in front in, in front of us. Um, the the way the 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 thing you mentioned about uh, producing ocean energy to Europe, I mean, this is a different aspect because it's basic is an an aspect much more related to the integration of the 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 grid network. I would, I think is a there are many steps on this on this direction, and I would like to see, and I believe that will be possible. To have Portugal and Spain together uh, um, uh, exporting energy to the rest of Europe, uh, I see it as a very promising um, scenario. But uh, yeah, let's see. Thank let's you. see what happens. Okay, Mark. Thanks. Thanks very much. Just to close, uh, uh, a question for uh, for Inês uh, from João. Very short question and concise one, I guess. Uh, Inej, thank you for your presentation. My question is how good, effective are algae as a carbon sink? Uh, well, uh, this is an interesting question. I, in terms of, um, of uh, water quality and uh, carbon absorption, it's uh, ecologically speaking, it's rather, rather interesting that uh, that algae can incorporate uh, carbon in the water uh, column. So um, as uh, this in this in this perspective, they're in a very interesting uh, carbon sink. Uh, all in all, they're the basis of the um, uh, marine um, food web so they enter the the food web cycle uh, through this through this process uh, after incorporated in the algae they are the algae serve as food for other animals and so on and so on so throughout this process uh, the the carbon enters the food web and uh, so I would consider it uh, rather efficient in terms of contributing to the to the overall health of the the ecosystem at uh, the long term i really understand that this this needs to be much better studied uh, so i i cannot give you the, the precise answer in terms of long term okay thanks very much inish thank pass you towards to my colleagues again yes thank you tiago uh, thank you everyone that has been watching we've reached the end of our webinar today uh, thank you, Benjamin, Marco, Inez, and Tiago for taking on this challenge. We have learned a lot with you today. And for the ones watching, we will have a short break in our EDP new uh, R&D sessions. The next one will be in September. So we'll see you in September in the next R&D session by EDP new. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.